So good afternoon, audience. So I hope that we'll get a few more people to listen to, I, I think, uh, quite an interesting session. It's quite heterogeneous, but uh, there are a lot of interesting thoughts and, and reflections that could help us to entertain a lot of discussion at the end and hopefully also over the dinner tonight. So we start with uh, Dr. Lou Ballot. Lou, you can see what he is. Basically, he's now editor-in-chief of a very important nanomedicine journal, as you can see here. But what is not written here, and I think it's quite remarkable, uh, that he's one of the five founders of the American Society for Nanomedicine, um, being a non-American, which is, uh, I think, quite an achievement in this uh, early field in America. And Lou is going to discuss a very in interesting topic uh, regarding publications that we all are facing with, uh, whether we would like to see more non-peer-reviewed articles, free articles, or peer-reviewed, and that's the topic of his talk, and I look forward to it. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the interested parties. <laughs> uh, just uh, uh, once again, you started open this line of questioning that I shall continue. That actually, the, out of the five members, uh, of funding members of American Society for Nanomedicine, there are two Hungarians, two Chinese, and one Indian. So there's no American there. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so review by peers has been a method of since ancient Greece. It's, it started in a little bit different way. And it's already around uh, uh, 800, 900 AD of Syria first described the peer review process. It stated that the physician must make notes of patient condition and was cured or had died, they examine. Uh, the body, and uh, they, if it didn't mean the required standard of medical care, the, ne the peer reviews were negative. The physician could face the lawsuit for my patient or, or its, uh, his relatives, probably. So then in the 17th century, they started the scientific clubs of societies. They got together and they discussed it, uh, and giving credibility and established a formal process. And the philosophical transaction of royal society is thought to be the very first one around the 1800s. And uh, it, uh, as early as uh, 1905, the first uh, paper of uh, Einstein actually was not peer reviewed. It was just accepted by the two editors, the editor in chief and the co editor. They didn't send it out to peer review. Uh, quite unusually, uh, I hope I start, I'm not going to talk about the uh, the kinds, the current methods. I'm not going to talk about the process, you all know that. And I'm not going to talk about the content that is all what's around and behind. You can find all these things uh, on the web and, and the many other ways of discussion. What, I'm trying, what I will talk about is, uh, I'd like to give you a little bit of understanding what's behind the whole problem, uh, what the whole issue is not a real problem. So first of all, we are undergoing a very much accelerating and expanding world. For the first time in human history, we are generating information faster that we can understand it. I mean, talking about the general public. And it can be evaluated by traditional methods. Today, <laughs> is the, every 30 seconds, a scientific paper is published, which is incredible. <laughs> we have 86,400 86, seconds on a day. 25.1 million papers in 2014, so you do the math, uh, that's about 30 seconds for one, and uh, a total in the lit scientific literature, a total of 35 million papers are there, which is kind of, even if you look at this all areas, it's kind of, kind of impossible to, to remember everything. But I want to re remind you of one thing, that science, it's a <coughs> dissipation of science, and. Uh, and uh, uh, distribution of scientific results and science publishing is not exactly the same. They just serve the same purpose on, on the areas that they overlap. Science publishing is a business. So what do people buy? People buy two kinds of things. Well, some things that they need and things that they are interested in. 
And if you understand this basic principle, you will see how and why it is taking shape as it is. Publishers essentially sell selected scientific information to scientists in the form of magazines and journals. There are different uh, models, business models. I'm going to leave it to Karin to talk about, but uh, what I definitely want to mention is that somebody always has to pay the bills. Nothing is free. But today, the pressure is on scientists, and all three qualities. They are readers, they are the authors, they are reviewers, and they are evaluated by the research output and its impact, in quote, unquote. They are, so they must demonstrate their own value by publishing significant and original results in high-value media. So all we need to know is just what is significant, what is original, and what is high-value. And to whom? The publishing companies are also under tremendous pressure because there are a lot of, lot of things change. There's an information revolution. There's a globalization is going on. There's an increasing accessibility and mobility and data transfer rate of everything. Distribution of data and the internet through direct exchange and the, therefore there are new business models that have to be generated uh, in this area that's going on. And then, as a result, the thousands of small companies uh, formed and uh, publishing businesses are about 1,500, uh, last I looked. They are fractioning the market and processing, uh, promising every day they can a short review time, immediate decision, high impact, self-calculated, of course, and so on, so on, so on. <coughs> so that's an exponential increasing number of research output. As I said, told before, there are 35 millions in the database about 28,000 journals in the Elsevier Scopus. Publishing companies, the same, they live and die by the profit. So they're under tremendous pressure to demonstrate their own value to customers and they keep expanding their markets. And they need to know what are these high value original and significant really mean for their customers, for individuals and libraries. But, uh, who will buy those journals that, to, to, that thought to be right for them? Not necessarily right, thought to be right. And the quality information, who are trying to find quality information for minimal price. So what is really important to find a balance between these two areas. And scientists, as readers, they need to know what is happening in their field, not everything. They are, although many of them are, we are curious people. Many of, uh, many of us are just simply interested in other things. That has caught my attention. The authors, they have to secure research funding. To, in order to do that, they must disseminate their own research as quickly as possible in, again, high value, blah, 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 the same thing. They actually, they volunteer to review manuscripts uh, by, uh, as part of academic obligations in order that are uh, there was a, a scope was made about 6,000 authors, authors uh, replied, and they, that's where the n number, numbers are coming from. But the quality of information can only be decided by peers. It cannot be decided by computers. It cannot be decide, decided, especially in a very broad sense, by uh, only editors. And so often, even though it is often presented by just looking at the prestige or the quality of the journals. So between 2003 and 2013, there are more funding is available for lesser number of grants. This is just the EPSRC data, but the general data show the same, which makes grant write proposal, writing proposal the most important activity instead of working on science. Uh, um, it's very of, happens very often that the uh, uh, PIs are writing proposals, writing grants, writing reports, and then the student writes the paper. And the professor looks at it, and they send it in, then comes back with a review. Does it sound familiar? So uh, instead of focusing on high quality of science, it's also following science publication has become a daunting text. And because one can follow a narrow field only, you search by keywords. But the keywords give you exactly what you are looking for. The, you, you don't get the context. And the meaning of value, anyway, is different from different people. On average, today, a reader, uh, 2013 data, 
spend seven hours to download on average five to f four to five, five to six, six articles about of half of it which regarded really useful when it is read. In the past 10 years, there are now 7.6 million people, approximately scientists. The number of authors per article is rising. It's 4.1. The number of articles by unique authors, in in interestingly, in the past 10 years, was unchanged. So it's just fractioning of the same data, more data, the same groups, and it's fractioning the same. Authors are motivated more papers and not better papers. We all know that. So how many reviewers would be required? <laughs> so 2.5 million papers had required at least five to 7.5 million critiques, depending on the two, uh, two or three accepted reviews or critiques per paper. But review, review response rate is about 50%. Everybody has a life, travels, they write this and read that. So, and the best ones who are the most experts are already committed and already taken. It's very interesting if you look at the, the data. Uh, this is the line when the review, the reviewers, number of reviewers per number of uh, uh, publications. So this cluster is pretty much around it, but much less reviewers are coming from China, even where they have the highest acceptance rate. And uh, that looks uh, that uh, the much more reviewers are invited from the United States. So peer review comes from both editors and the reviewers. This is my view. Editors are dedicated, but very busy usually. They have either a full expertise of this area, they can make, uh, at least at our journal, they can make a decision right away, uh, positive or negative. They may have the only partial expertise because nobody understands in nanomedicine every bit. There's no people who understands everything in nanomedicine, that includes me. Uh, we have to talk to people who are experts. And sometimes they do have marginal expertise and they, that uh, our editors are encouraged to give it back to me on that. And in here, they invite reviewers from, that, from those areas. So the section reviewers are very uh, important. However, they are skewed in expertise. As I said, there are much more lower expertise and much less higher expertise people. Who is the corresponding author? This is the, usually the top. Who is reviewing them? Usually the middle or the lower edge who has time. So, uh, so nothing is perfect as usual. And there are many different motivations, that there's time availability and expertise might, might differ. So let me point out that we are the peers. Who are the peers? We are. So if we <coughs> do not take care of our own quality control, why do you expect it from, some, from somebody else? But the system is like, I always say, it's like a democracy. It's imperfect, but there is no better at the moment. There are higher, uh, outputs, there are more effective ways, but there is no better way. So average level of the reviewers or the dimension that associate assistant professor, we, at uh, my journal, we don't allow uh, people who are not PhDs or equivalent at least, so no students. Critics are advised and so the reviewers, reviewers advise and always the editors have to take decisions. All those editors who hide behind the, the back of the reviewers are not the good ones. And editors are also people. We can make mistakes. If you think it's not satisfied with the decision, argue. All professional arguments will be taken into account. So what can be done? This is the last one. Uh, I suggest that we need to expand valuation. We need to value the researchers in an academic field as well. Reviewer, reward reviews, especially with the top ones who are putting in 20, 25 papers a year. Except the IP, technology, R, and the products as scientific achievement. This is a, something that has been uh, uh, discussed forever. Uh, why not the practical use? A valued research output after certain years, I can explain a 5, 10, 15 if someone's really interested why. It, and most importantly, we should educate somehow administrators to use measurements for departments and people more. There are many others available, and every measurement, every number just means an output of the calculation the way it was made, nothing more. And this is the journal impact factor which was created for journals and not for people. 
publishing in the journal. It's usually it's a hyperbolic curve. And except in face reality when it's based on data, I, I, I have a number of uh, negative experiences. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Lou. This is now open for discussion, for a few questions. As you know, the major discussion on all the different topics of today will be held at the end of this session. For half an hour, we will open for all different questions and different topics. But there are now a chance for two or so questions to Lou. Right now, the, uh, the very, I didn't say that, and I didn't put the numbers that. An average paper, uh, so the average review takes about four hours of work. You read it, you think about it, you make notes, you put together, you send it in, you format, and so on. So it's on average, it's four hours. Of course, average is, uh, some of them are taking much more, some are taking much less because it's always in the middle, very easy to find the top ones and very easy to find the bottom ones, and in between you spend a lot of time. And this is not uh, rewarded in any way, and that's not right, that's not right. There are uh, publishers that are trying to put that out there sending, uh, I personally, I send uh, thank you letters to him or her after like doing 15 reviews a, a year and ask, shall I send it to your supervisor? would be anybody, because a letter to the dean that this guy is a good guy, it's a, it's, it makes a difference, or may, might make a difference. So this, this is what I meant. Uh, and uh, <coughs> definitely we need to start with the top ones, or uh, top ones, I mean. Yes? Yeah, can you please use please the microphone? Please use the microphone, because it's being recorded and uh, my answer is recorded by the question. Is, not is it on? Is it on? Yeah. It, it is. Uh, your title ended with a question mark. <laughs> your personal conclusion is uh, a yes or, or no or not yet decided or uh, is uh, the, the sole decision uh, the, the economical uh, question? Is it worth uh, to do peer review if, uh, if the paper is sold? That's, uh, <laughs> good, good question. So first of all, uh, the traditional uh, way of uh, uh, peer reviewing paper was, was, was strictly before publication. And uh, there are many other attempts ex uh, ex uh, expanded to after publication because then it really gets out. And for those communities who are using those data, they can decide. Uh, you can say that's why citations are, also which shows uh, professional interest and the other alt metrics and other pub, uh, uh, metrics, public media are counted because that uh, suppose a general interest of the general public, they probably will not continue with that. But, but that is also some, a value that, that uh, has to be taken. Now right now we are in the area when the traditional peer review is still uh, maybe not imperfect, as I said, but uh, but uh, there is no better thing, no, no better way. But you need to work on number one, expand it on the other field, reward it, because it's part of a science. It is a serious scientific uh, work, and uh, number three <coughs> is evaluate and reevaluate it from time to time and feed it back to the academic community. So it's worth to do it. Uh, if you get fifty dollars, do you make a better review? I don't think so, that's, but the, uh, accepting the achievement, that's, that's something that is important. At least recognizing it, at least. Just takes a little effort. And then we have to figure out other ways. It's the way it grows, the way it goes, uh, it's very important that editors do take responsibilities, whatever they, even if we don't make all the, all the time the, the correct decisions. Make the best decision, what else? Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Lou, for this very interesting reflections on, on uh, publishing. I think we have to move on now with the second speaker. Thank you.